All right, hi, I'm Pat Rizzuto, and I'm very grateful to the Sustainable Nanotechnology Organization for inviting me to participate today. Um, a lot of the folks that are behind the ideas that the organization represents helped teach me a lot of stuff about nanotechnology as I was first learning about it. And so I'm very, very grateful to all the professors and government workers and others who took time to explain things. Um, and so my job is just to explain how I go about gathering information when I'm asked to look into something new. And then I hope to also pass on some tips both for folks who are going to be interviewed or for students if you're going to be doing the interviewing, which you, I hope, will be doing as part of your own research. And so um, first, these are you know, the topics I'm going to head hopefully discuss starting out, something about web discovered information, interviews, and then wrap it up with a few useful websites for varying ages of audiences. Oh. These were just to remind me to say to follow your curiosity or whatever topic you are looking at. If you do not have the luxury of picking it out yourself, if you're assigned it, then find something that intrigues it, you about it. Because if you're really researching it, it's going to get boring at some point, but if you can retain your spark of what originally interested you, you'll keep going through the slogging part of, this, of the learning process, and then you'll be really proud of what comes out at the end. And then the second picture is to remind all of us never be too grown up to go back to really simple sources. Um, I rented a room from a historian who taught me that when she has to tackle a new project, she goes to the library and takes out a kid's book and reads about it because it makes it no longer a blank page. It's something that she begins to have a concept about. And then she can go on to the academic journals and everything else that she needs to, to do to do a proper work, uh, piece of work on it. But she starts with simplicity. And the simplest questions are often just the best ones. So um, now, on to the main tool that most of us are using to gather information these days, the internet. Um, whenever you're using information that you've gathered from a site, make sure that you look at the site thoroughly, carefully. There are lots of the obvious hints, you know, it does it say .gov, government, .edu, educational, .com, is it from a company, .org, is it from a nonprofit or other organization. Any of those websites can provide useful information, but just knowing the source provides you some context for it. Um, check out the site. Does it have an About Us section? If it is allegedly a professional scientific group, um, do they publish a journal? Do they meet annually? Do they have statements about their positions on topics? You can get to know a lot just by exploring their website. Um, if it's a nonprofit organization, how, um, how is it described in the Encyclopedia of Associations? Um, if you're connected to a school, the library should have that. Um, look at the website. Um, does it? Is it sloppy? Does it have a lot of typos? How often is it updated? Um, again, these are just hints that help you understand, is this something I can trust or should I have my warning lights on inside? Um, please, please, please move beyond Google. Um, our librarians drilled it into us at my company that we must use more than one search engine because they're all designed to find different types of information. For example, if I am trying to find out more about um, a particular individual and I really need their email address to start the conversation, Google doesn't help me very much. Um, Bing helps me find individuals' web uh, individuals' email addresses. Um, so one, some of the cool tools that do these broader searches for you are something called clusty.com. It brings the results of multiple search engines to you. Um, then you have the problem of having too much, but there are different ways that you can tailor your search. Um, 
ask your librarians. They can teach you how to do tailored searches, and they love to teach. That's their job, and they're really good at it. Uh, InfoMind, that's again, that's a library of different resources. It's fabulous, and the Internet Archive is a wonderful example um, to get you know, movies, music, audio, and something called the Wayback Machine, which it actually takes snapshots of websites at different periods of time. Okay, we're not talking way, way back, you know, we're talking 1990s, but still, um, sometimes you really want to compare what somebody said about something now versus 10 years ago. That can be really interesting. Um, Wikipedia, okay, this is Pat Rizzuto's rule. Um, I can use Wikipedia if I know about the subject. It can usually uh, give me an example of how to phrase something much more clearly, um, but I cannot use it if I do not know anything about the subject. It is verboten. What I can use Wikipedia for is to go down to the footnotes and then get the information from the original source. Um, and again, keep in mind the purpose and the content of the site. Is it informational, educational? Is it for commercial use? Is it for advocacy? You want all those elements. They're all useful. None of them are bad. But you've got to know what you're getting from that. Uh, all right, interviews. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope you will be doing, if you're a student, in-person interviews. Best of all, in that person's work setting. You're going to learn the most if they're um, in a setting where they're comfortable, can show you how they reached their conclusion. That's the ideal. Um, there's a lot better communication that happens that way. If I'm interviewing somebody, They'll understand because I start hesitating in my questions, because my body starts, my body language starts retreating. They'll understand when I'm really not understanding what they're saying. And it's okay to ask me two, even three times. I didn't quite understand that question because I usually don't know enough about something when I'm starting out to ask a good question. And so by that exchange, my question will be refined. Also, um, it, it just, you create more time for each other when you do it in person. But in person is not possible an awful lot of the time. And for students, it can be really hard to get in-person interviews. Um, so by phone is a wonderful, opportunity, it's easier to take notes, but remember, you can't read the body language, so be very comfortable saying, I didn't understand what you meant. There's nothing wrong with not understanding and having it clarified. Email is only good for double checking specific black and white things. Did you say 10 micrometers or 10 nanometers? Email is not good for clarifying anything. <laughs> Um, if you're the person being interviewed, ask the reporter who he or she is writing for. They know their audience. Ask him or her if they have an idea what kind of story they're working on. Are they really doing a story just on your particular study, or is it part of a much broader piece? Um, that'll help you uh, know how much information you'll need to give the reporter. Um, Again, if you're dealing with broadcast media, ask questions so that you're better prepared. Um, and unfortunately, don't be surprised if you give us a lot of time and see one or two comments in our story, or you know, a few seconds in broadcast media. Um, the truth is that the information you provide journalists is actually woven throughout that story. It just doesn't have your name attached. You influenced the whole story because you influenced how we understood it. Um, uh, again, explain your work simply. I can't tell you how many times I have asked that. Um, avoid technical terms. Technical terms may impress your colleagues, they confuse journalists. And you don't want us to be confused. And be prepared to talk about wider implications. Every reporter should ask that question. 
and if it really doesn't have any wider implications, that's okay to say. Um, be prepared for interviews, but be really flexible. My experience is that scientists are so smart and they prepare so thoroughly and then I ask them a question that's not something they prepared for and I'll always ask a question that they haven't prepared for and they are frozen like deer you know, caught in a car headlight. But if the person could relax, he or she knows the answer. I mean, I'm interviewing him or her because they're the expert in something. They know this backwards and forwards or I wouldn't be interviewing them. It's just maybe not on their prepared list. Relax, have confidence in yourself, you know the answer. Um, be prepared for, because what constitutes a story for us is not necessarily what you had in mind when you said yes to the interview. Um, and a good example of this comes from some research that some folks down at the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences did many years ago. Um, it had all started way back uh, in Love Canal, which if you don't know what Love Canal is, that was a terrible toxic website, uh, web, uh, excuse me, that was a terrible toxic waste dump up in New York and it pulled a lot of people together and really started the environmental movement or gave it enough emphasis that things like the Environmental Protection Agency were founded. Um, well, as part of their research at that time with the individuals affected by that waste, um, they realized that there were some reproductive effects, but they couldn't tell. They thought that the chemicals were causing the women to abort really, really early, but um, they didn't have any way to know because the women wouldn't have known if they were pregnant at that point. I mean, we're talking really, really early. So they kept studying that, studying that in their career, and eventually they came out with information that helped with early pregnancy tests, the kind of thing that we take for granted now. And that was the story. But for an environmental health reporter, the story was how a fertility test was linked back to Love Canal. So you never know where it's going to be, and that's why it is useful to know about our audience. Um, and I'm sorry, but for me, I think this is true. Uh, science and news are poor fits because science mostly is about small steps, and news wants solutions, problems, something unique, and yet we really need each other. Um, uh, just a couple of thoughts about how I gauge a scientist's credibility when I'm uh, interviewing him or her. It's usually by how they talk about the work of others. I mean, of course, I, I'm not only interviewing people I think are credible. Um, and yes, I've read through their bios, but bios, I don't know how to tell how credible they are. Usually the person's been recommended to me. I mean, I do that kind of basic groundwork first, but does that person respect the work of others, especially the work of others who have come to different conclusions? Does that person say, I know these other conclusions are out there and I respect them, but this is how I reached a different conclusion. Somebody like that goes way up on my credibility meter. Um, if the findings that somebody is telling you about are a radical departure from what everybody else is in the, saying in the field, that's really cool, but it may be garbage. Your warning lights should be flashing in your head. Be really, really careful. Don't dismiss them. Just be really careful. And always ask one scientist to recommend the names of other scientists you should speak with. Um, if you are being interviewed, Offer to be available to answer follow-up questions or even check out draft descriptions of your work. Uh, we may or we may not be able to take you up on that um, offer, but it's really good to know that you're willing. Um, and I'm sorry that we have such short deadlines, but we really do. And so if I say my deadline is at four, I really do mean it because it means it has to be before my editors at five o'clock. Um, and it's often the scope of the story. If I'm interviewing 10 different scientists, I am not logistically going to be able to send something to each of them. But if I'm interviewing just you, and it's about your work and your project, or just a couple of you, 
I really like to do that because it's your work and I want to make sure that I describe it accurately. Um, and then I just ended with a couple of websites that I found useful um, on nanotechnology for all sorts of different ages in, and these are some general science websites that a scientist I have interviewed often recommended and when I was preparing an advent calendar for some nephews and nieces, um, I tucked websites into the calendar so that they'd keep learning. So thank you very much.